and welcome to the all new, all different number one comics podcast episode number 55. Bob, episode number 55. Can't believe it. I know. Yeah, pretty much a year worth of episode. Right? 55. That's that's insane. Yeah. Insaneness. I, I feel like we say this almost every episode, but wow, 55 episodes. Or 54 in the can, 55 number here. Uh, Right here? What the hell am I saying? I don't we're know. Start, I, we're starting the can. Yeah, we're, we're starting off great on this episode as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan. That's Bob. Say hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. We are a, a comic book podcast in which every episode we take a look at a brand new first issue comic book, break down the story and art, give it some to review, and let you know if we think that you should move on to issue number two or not. Uh, we also talk a little bit of comic book and related news as well as what's new in comic book shops this and next week. Uh, and occasionally we throw like a nice little uh, creator interview or, or something on there as well. Uh, we do have an interview at the end of this episode with uh, part two of Steve Ekstrom's interview, who is uh, currently uh, producing John Carpenter's The Fog comic book. So... Be on the lookout for that at the end of the episode. But Bob, tell them what we're covering this week. So today we're covering from IDW Comics, Saturday Morning Adventures, Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, we're getting nerd on nerd episode. <laughs> we are. And this one, I, the the title doesn't have a subtitle, but once you open up the book, it says, uh, it says, let's see, let me flip to the correct page. Wow, it's, it's about, uh, it's a few pages in before it starts. Okay. Dungeons and Dragons Saturday Morning Adventures. Here there be pirates part one. Um, you know, Bob, if, if, if I can say, and of course we'll get into our review a little bit later, but if I can say one thing that I'm not, uh, one, one trope that I'm not a huge fan of is the here there be, you know, that kind of talk, like whatever you call that talk, <laughs> I'm just not into it. It's not cute or funny or anything to me. See, stuff like that. Stuff like that was really big back in the sixties. If you look at like, <laughs> yeah. if you look at like sixties, like early sixties, late sixties, you know, uh, superhero comics, mm -hmm. you know, Avengers stuff like that. Sure, there's always a um, ho there be or mm -hmm. um, you know, just I mean, just some you know Victorian talk like that. Yeah, I, man, I don't know what it is. Not not super into it, but uh, that's that's my opinion. Um, so I'll I'll keep that to myself from here on out. But uh, Bob, we are gonna take a quick break, and when we return, we're gonna talk about uh, either comic book news or lack thereof. <laughs> And we are back with episode number 55 of the all-new, all-different, number one comics podcast. Bob, news. It's time for the news segment. As you know, as we, wow, as we have discussed already, there's not a whole lot of news. I actually... Yeah, uh, news light. Yeah, all of my news sites are reporting nothing, really. Uh, there's like, you know, I don't know, just filler nonsense in there. Not really anything to talk about. So, um... I'll, I will go off my, you know, key collector alerts and then we can talk about something else. But, um, of course, uh, we have news that Wilson Bethel, <laughs> Bethel, I don't know how you say yes. his last name, um, will return as Bullseye and Daredevil Born Again. So we get Bullseye again there. Super cool. Excited for that. Um, we also got... The announcement that the second part of season two of Invincible will debut on Amazon Prime on March fourteenth. If you're an Am or sorry, an Invincible fan, not an Amazon fan, you know, uh, being an Amazon fan would be very interesting because then you'd have a lot of content you'd have to go through every day. But yeah, uh, yeah if you're an Invincible fan, then that's there for you. Uh, I I don't share that sentiment, but you know. Uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pose your question right mm -hmm. now. So, what's your opinion on these streaming services doing a see like a season two part one and a season two part two? You know, I'm 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 not a huge fan of it. I don't understand them trying to go back to that old model of even even airing things. You know, not all at once. Like I I don't understand what the purpose is. I know Disney Plus tried it for, you know, the Marvel shows that were coming out week to week and stuff. And it's just, it doesn't work anymore. We're spoiled by streaming services. Like, whatever it is, just drop the whole damn thing and, and move on, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that's that's what works. Then you can watch it at your own convenience. A lot of people, like me included, 
I've got like one day a week where I can sit down and watch, you know, some stuff. Um, and if you don't drop everything, then guess what? I'm not going to watch like 30 minutes or an hour of something and then move on. And then next week, go back to it and stuff. I don't have time. Like I, sometimes I have time to sit there all day and watch TV, you know, randomly, like once every two months or something. Mm. And then the rest of the time, I don't have any time to do that at all. So, uh, I don't know. It's just inconvenient for me at this point. And, and I know that's not specifically what you asked, but yeah, I don't want like part one and part two of a season. Yeah. That sounds stupid. Like, I, just give me the well, whole thing. Yeah, and then the fact that, you know, part one and part two, I mean, it's going to be, if there's an eight episode season, mm -hmm. of course it's going to be divided up into four episodes. Sure. And there's going to be like three or four months at least in between. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's kind of like, just just release it weekly. Yeah, I don't see why not. I, I, I don't see what the, the purpose of this is. I don't yeah, know how I, that's helping I mean, anything. Even from a financial standpoint, I don't see what it could, you know, gain. Like, I, I guess the only thing I can think of is, is that how they're keeping up with the demand. You know, are they are they doing half of the season, uh, doing all the work on that, and then um, releasing it, and then doing the rest of the work while that's airing, and then, you know, coming out with the next part? I, I don't know, but... Yeah, I'm not interested in it either. If, if there was a show that I was really following that was doing that, I think that that would turn me off a little bit. Uh, gladly, uh, like I said, I mean, not not to say anything about anybody who likes Invincible. Uh, that's totally fine. I just don't. I'm, I'm not going to watch it. You know, I, I tried to watch a, a couple of episodes, and I, it's not my thing at all. So I'm not mm -hmm. into it. I won't be watching this. But, uh, you know, if, if that's what you're into, then I guess you get part one of season two. and <laughs> Or, or uh, sorry, part two of season two on March 14th. So good for you. Um, we got the announcement that Scout Comics, uh, their comic book Distorted from last year has been optioned to a TV series by MPE, whatever MPE is. Um, yeah, so I, Bob, I know I have a couple of copy, or I actually, I think rather I just have one copy of this book, but um, I know I have a copy of this book. I don't know that I ever read it. I'm not sure what it's about. It's it's three stories of people cursed with superpowers intersecting. Don't know much about it. Sounds like a cool, uh, you know, uh, TV show. Sure, why not? Um, yeah, I, I could get down on that. Uh, I, I don't know how many people have a copy of that book. I don't know how many were printed, but <laughs> I, I can't imagine a whole lot from Scout there. Looks kind of like an all-ages book, too, so we'll, we'll have to see about that. Uh, and, and again, that's really all the news that I have. There's not a whole lot to talk about this mm -hmm. time. Uh, Bob, but you did have something that we could discuss here on air. Uh, I'd love it if uh, you you don't mind bringing that up. Well, actually, before I did that, I just, I just want to um, put out in the ether mm -hmm. a little uh, piece of news, which I'll just let you know about, that uh, Mark Strong has been pegged to play Carmine Falcone in the Penguin series. Yes. So uh, Mark Strong, and as you said, he, he uh, pretty much already played that character yeah. in Kick-Ass. So, mm -hmm. um, Mark Strong, a very good actor. Yeah. So, very strong so, actor. <laughs> ooh, Pun intended, right? Um, but yeah, it uh, sounds like he'll pull it off well. So yes. no worries there. Uh, the Penguin series uh, sounds like it's going to be good. I might give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess as long as it's not as dark as that Batman movie, then maybe I'll <laughs> I'll attempt to watch it as well. <laughs> There'll be a scene where the penguins just walking slowly <laughs> on a uh, on a uh, platform. There you go, a black screen and everything. I like yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah, the, the so the list that I let you know about um, it's award seasons. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is. <laughs> you have the Golden Raspberry or Razzie Awards, which mm -hmm. we both know is for the, you know, bottom rung yes. of anything movies. I mean, you have picture, director, actor, actress, uh, supporting actor, supporting actress. And, I mean, one or two of these will be comic book related. I mean, for the most part, they aren't comic book related. But I figure since, you know, this does have to do with comic book news, I yeah. figured I'd bring it up. And news is so light, you know, yes. why the hell not? So, the nominees for Worst Picture are 
The Exorcist Believer, which I didn't watch. <laughs> but I believe it, Bob, because I've heard lots and lots of bad things. I haven't I, watched I've, heard, I've heard that, too. Um, you have Expendables or Expendables, <laughs> however you want to say it. I mean, And yeah, I could see you, that, yeah. You have fan four sticks. So sure, yeah, yeah sure. Expendables. Sure. <laughs> uh, then, <clears throat> sorry. Um... One nominee that didn't make sense to me, because this movie, I feel, you know, was made to be kind of, you know, corny and kind of, you know, shut your brain off and mm-hmm. just get entertained. You have Meg to the Trench. Yeah, and when, you know, that one kind of messes me up because I, I agree with you. It's so fun. To, I mean, yeah. What are, we, what are we taking seriously out of this? And on top of that, are we just giving it a, or nominating it for a Razzie for concept? Because it's not like, you know, anybody did a bad job in it. It's I mean, it looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. To um, me, it's like a Fast and Furious movie. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big time guilty pleasure of mine. But I mean, I that, don't share that. But <laughs> that, That's one of those shut your brain off. And just watch it for what it is. Yeah, just Dumb have a good time. That's that's what it is. Um, so yeah, uh, it's like you think about some of the past, like you know, big Razzie winners like uh, Catwoman and stuff like that. And I mean, there was big problems with that movie. It yeah. wasn't uh, just uh, like you know a concept that film snobs didn't like. There was a lot more to it uh, for it to get that nomination. So yeah, very exactly. interesting. Uh, the last two rounding out the list. Uh, you have Shazam, Fury of the Gods, mm-hmm. which Dan has not seen, <laughs> you know, and will not see. Uh, to lay that out on Front Street, personally, I thought it was okay. Mm-hmm. Didn't think it was great. Didn't think it was horrible. Mm-hmm. I just thought, like, I just thought that it was okay. And and again, uh, same thing that. Well, I can't say same thing because I I disagree with the concept. I think it's a, a dumb concept, but uh, not a poorly made movie. Probably, you know, most likely not a poorly acted movie, not a bad script, uh, just something that film snobs don't particularly like is is, is why it's probably on that list. Um, and, and I'm not defending the movie. I hated Shazam 1. I won't she's see Shazam 2 based on that. And I really don't like Zachary Levi either. Um, but, you know, do I think that it deserves a Razzie as like a bad, badly made or acted or whatever movie? I don't think so in that regard. No. And rounding out the list, this one, to me, I haven't seen the movie. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to see it. But to me, this falls in the category of The Meg 2. Mm -hmm. You have Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And, yeah. We know why (laughs) it was made. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Was this made to be a campy... uh, you know, horror movie because yes. Winnie the Pooh went in the public domain. Yes, absolutely. Is this trying to win an award for best picture or anything? No. Hell no. no. Like it never was a contender for that. So it doesn't have any big budget or big actors or makers or anything behind it. So why are we nominating it for a worst picture award? And I mean, of course it's going to be nominated for worst, <laughs> worst picture award because how much money was actually spent on it? It's almost like I feel that if, you know, you went onto YouTube and somebody uh, recorded their their kid's third birthday party and then they said, this is the worst picture of the year. Of yeah. course it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't meant to be uh, considered for like a Academy Award. I mean, technically, if, you, if you're getting technical, I mean, that's pretty much all a movie is. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I'm not sure. I mean, it, yeah. I, I think I think there should be a little bit more of a criteria here, uh, criteria here. Maybe pick from movies that submitted to take the it, Academy Awards the, or something. Maybe pick films that are are you know supposed to be made seriously. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're talking about dumb fun action and horror movies and things like that. Uh, they're, they're not going to be the best picture of the year. Yeah, sure. I'm so I'm sorry. I love Jason Statham. As an actor. Mm-hmm. But I mean, his movies are not going to be Shakespeare. Absolutely They're not. They're not going to produce Shakespeare. <laughs> no. I don't see Jason Statham winning a Best Actor award from the Oscars. But I mean, that's okay. Now, Bob, wouldn't you 
put your foot in your mouth if next year a movie was announced a Shakespeare biopic with Jason Statham playing oh, Shakespeare. God, I will eat crow. <laughs> I will eat so much crow on it. But I mean, Jason Statham movies, action, mm-hmm. explosions, sure. yep, you know, uh, car chases, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yep. And I'm sorry. One film that was not on here that I think deserves it, Mm -hmm. The Flash. Yeah, I can agree with you on that, especially if we're putting Shazam on the list. Now, I, you know, for the full disclaimer, I did see Shazam 1. I I really did not like it. I would say I hated it. Um, I also saw The Flash, and I did not see Shazam 2. But to put that in perspective, I think... Uh, you know, they're the Flash one, or sorry, the Flash and then Shazam one, both bad movies in my opinion. Uh, I, 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 I think they were really, really bad. And then throw on top of that, you know, I, of course I don't like Zachary Levi much as a person either, but he's definitely not on the same level as Ezra Miller, who is a, a human no. garbage can. You know, uh, so yeah, I mean. Shit, why why did we not put the flash on this? It was a terrible movie. It was terribly made. It looks horrible. I mean, why did we <laughs> why did we have Meg 2 on there? Which looks and wonderful, the you know? Uh, Meg 2 had some great special effects. The first Meg is actually has become one of my favorite movies. It's a wonderful movie. I remember seeing that opening week in theater. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's very interesting what they go with. So, but, yeah. uh, again, we're dealing, you know, when dealing with film snobs, I guess you get film snobbery. Snobbery. I don't know how you pronounce that yeah. word. But um, you got more? Yes. Keep it going. Um, <laughs> to go to a worst actor, you have Russell Crowe for The Pope's Exorcist, mm-hmm. which I actually, I heard The Pope's Exorcist was Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard bad things as well. Uh, you had Vin Diesel for Fast X. Sure. Which... <laughs> I, I do I do think Vin Diesel kind of phoned it in on this one. Mm-hmm. You know, I again, Fast and Furious movies, one of my guilty pleasures. But I, just to me, there was no chemistry. How many times did you count him say the word family? Oh, he, he said that <laughs> multiple. I I that's a good drinking game. There you go. Every time Vin <laughs> Diesel says family, take a shot. <laughs> oh man, you'd be wasting. Just money don't drive. Money. Yeah, please don't. You have Chris Evans for Ghosted. Okay. I actually never saw Ghosted. Yeah, I don't know much about Ghosted. Uh, Chris Evans, a pretty good actor, though. Yeah. Uh, interesting. He is. Uh, again, Jason Statham, Meg <laughs> to the wow. Trench. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. you got to take Jason Statham at face value. I agree, but apparently that Academy doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> And then you have John Voight for Mercy. First of all, I didn't know John Voight was still acting. Yeah, likewise. How old is John Voight at this point? Oh, um... 70? I don't know. Still for time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, fair enough. Uh, uh, alternately, um, you know, depending on how long this goes, I, I might jump into the actual Academy Award nominations uh, very, very quickly after, you know, we wrap up the, the Razzie ones, so... Ooh. John Voight is 85 years old. 85? Wow, okay, I was way off. He's at least 15 <laughs> years older than what I said. Yeah, I, I, I knew I knew he was probably pushing 80, and I just didn't know he was that old. Jeez, and, and he's a, a contender for Worst Actor. Wow, I can't believe it. Uh, worst guy. Actress. One of the nominees is kind of surprising, mm-hmm. considering who it is. Um, you have, starting off the list, you have Anna de Armas for Ghosted. Yeah, and when you told me that, I was very, very surprised because I figured it would be Ana de Armas for Blonde, which, holy shit, I mean, how is that movie not on this list? Maybe it came out in 2022, I don't know, but wow, uh, that was a interesting, interesting fever dream that I had there, but yeah, <laughs> sure, okay. Um, then you had, then you have, I haven't seen all the list mm-hmm. through the previous years. This is the first Razzie list I've seen in a while. But I have a feeling this next actress frequents them quite often. Okay. <laughs> you have Megan Fox for Johnny and Clyde. Yeah, I don't think Megan Fox has ever been regarded as like a top tier act- actor or anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> I can't really even name any good movies that Megan Fox has been in. Sure, I can. Have you not seen Jennifer's Body? Bob. Okay, I have Bob, seen that's an that. amazing movie, and okay, she's actually have, very good in that. Okay, I have yeah. seen that. Uh, you have 
Selma Hayek for Magic Mike's Last Dance. I, I can't imagine Magic Mike's, Mike's Last Dance is probably the greatest movie ever, but uh, I mean, Selma Hayek, Hayek uh, usually a pretty good actor. Yeah. Uh, I think this is I think this is at least her second nomination. Mm-hmm. You have Jennifer Lopez for the mother. Oh yeah, I mean this has got to be at least her second. Uh, I'm trying to think back to some of those movies she was in. I think Geely. Uh, yeah, Geely, The Cell, uh, those early two thousands movie. movies. Yeah, and she was in the movie with her husband at the time. Did you see Jersey Girl? You ever seen that movie, the Kevin Smith movie? I did with, not see. Oh it. man, don't watch that. Uh, I love Kevin Smith, and I'll defend him all day. But Jersey Girl is terrible. <laughs> and the one that surprises me more than any other, considering who it is, you have Dame Helen Mirren for Shazam: Fury of the Gods. Look, I think that it's just tainted because she's in such a terrible movie, a terrible I DC too. franchise. I, do too. I don't think it has anything to do with her. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do. I do too. I don't. I don't think Helen Mirren's strength is superhero movies now, especially uh, ones where she has to act alongside uh, Zachary and Levi. Now, the only <laughs> comic movie I can really think of her in. Um, that I enjoyed was, um, oh, what was it? Uh, Red. I never saw Red. Red 2. Okay. It had, uh, Morgan Freeman, mm-hmm. Bruce Willis, uh, Helen Mirren. Wow. Where they, and, um, oh, um, dang it, now I can't, now I can't remember his name. <laughs> Someone else, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, they, they, they played just, uh, basically retired assassins. Who, okay. You know, come back to the life. Sure. Wow. So, uh, we have worst supporting actress. We have another actress I didn't know was still acting. We have Kim Cattrall for About My Father. Okay. I didn't know she was still acting. Hmm. <laughs> Once again, Megan Fox. Yep. Mm-hmm. For. It, Expendable, Expendables <laughs> four, yeah. D- don't even try it, Bob. Expendables four. Sure. Um, you had Biling for John and Clyde. Mm-hmm. Now I kind of gotta watch John and Clyde just to see. I how guess bad so. It is. I guess we should see it. <laughs> uh, you have Lucy Liu for Shazam: Fury of the Gods. Mm-hmm. Sure. An- uh, just a tainted movie. Yeah. yeah let's an- just another, say that. Another one who's kind of a bigger actress. Yeah. And then you have Mary Stewart Masterson for Five Min- Nights at Freddy's. Okay, it's Five Nights at Freddy's. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you know what it's based off of, you know the movie's not going to win any grand awards or anything. Yeah, and you know, I saw that movie uh, only because, you know, my niece is like really, really into it. And she she came over one night and wanted to watch it. So, so we put it on. Uh, you know, the movie sucked, but I'm not... A Five Nights at Freddy's fan. I obviously didn't grow up with that. I'm much older than that material. But uh, I don't think she was bad in it. I think it was just a dumb movie. And now the lead actor, he was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, then you had... Sorry, there's a few categories left, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, worst Supporting Actor. Michael Douglas for Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Uh, now, okay, I mean... <laughs> Michael do, you, Douglas, do you think that was another bad movie effect? I th- well, possibly, but also, I mean, personally, you know, Michael Douglas doesn't do it for me. Something about him, he's got this tone I'm just not a huge fan of, and I think he falls flat. I think he's, I think in the in the late two uh, thousands or whatever you want to call this, the the twenty twenties, the twenty odd. I don't know how you say that, but yeah, I don't think there's a place for Michael Douglas really anymore. I think you could put anybody else in that role, and it would have been a little bit better. But I think something about him just, you know, kind of turned me off from from okay. from that performance as well. Okay, better than Zachary Levi. <laughs> oh yeah, way better than Zachary <laughs> Levi. <laughs> uh, you have Mel Gibson for Confidential Informant. I never saw that movie. Yeah, never, who likes Mel Gibson at this point? You know, I mean, uh, another another. Hey, person. I mean, I th- I thought he was I thought he was good in the uh, John Wick. Uh, limited series on uh, Amazon. Yeah, you're a John Wick fan, though, so... This is true. <laughs> this is true. You're biased. Uh, another Ant-Man across Quantum... Quantum... Uh, Quantum... <laughs> Quantum Mania. Quantum Mania. Bill Murray. Okay. Sure. Uh, whatever. I mean, it's Bill Murray. No, he's fun. He's camp fun. You know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. 
You have a guy I've never heard of, Franco Nero, as the Pope, the Pope's exorcist. Yeah, pro- probably some you know relatively unknown actor. And then you have Sylvester Stallone, Expendables. Who's expecting Sylvester Stallone to? Okay, whatever. Sure. <laughs> I mean, a take a low low hit, I guess. Yes. Low hanging fruit. Um, then I'm gonna read this worst screen couple just because I think one of the nominees are kind of <laughs> uh, it kind of tickles me. Mm-hmm. Uh, worst screen couple. Any two merciless mercenaries, Expendables. Okay. <laughs> so just pair up anybody. Sure, anybody in that movie. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Uh, any two mu- money, gr- any two money grubbing investors who donated to the four hundred million. For remake rights to The Exorcist, <laughs> I kind of agree. On yeah, that. yeah, I, 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 can, I, I don't think that. The Exorcist needs to be remade. No. Have any more films about it? No, please. Can we be done with The Exorcist at this point? I mean, The Exorcist was a great movie first time. If you like it, sure. I enjoy it. I enjoyed it. Uh, Anna de Armas and Chris Evans, who flunked screen chemistry for Ghosted. Uh, yeah, again, we don't know, but sure. Mm. Selma Hayek and Channing Tatum for Magic Mike's Last Dance. I believe it. <laughs> you know, I'll go ahead and say I believe it. Uh, I, I don't know how much substance can be in Magic Mike. Now, this is true. And then you have Pooh and Piglet as bloodthirsty serial killers. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I can, Again, the lowest hanging fruit, you know, take possible. Take that movie for Freeze Valley. Yeah, sure. It shouldn't be included on this list. Sorry. I mean, we're, we're probably get, based on that we're probably going to see a Razzie next year for the uh, Mickey Mouse yeah the Steamboat Willie yeah stuff. horror movies sure, that, sure, of course. either one of them mm-hmm. you know since there are multiple ones coming out um, you have worst prequel remake ripoff or sequel Ant-Man and the Lost Quantumania hmm hmm interesting uh, The Exorcist Believer mm-hmm Expendables, mm-hmm. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Mm-hmm. I I definitely thought it was better than uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that's. Uh, easy did to did we sure. need the early scene with a shirtless Harrison Ford? No, <laughs> no, I don't think anybody wanted that. Mm-hmm. And then Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And, you know, my my question here is, okay, uh, sure, most of that list is fine. You put Ant-Man and Quantumania on there. I, I think, again, we have the film snobs who want to hate the MCU, sure. Uh, how the hell, uh, again, number one, is Flash not on there? Um, well, I guess it's not a sequel or whatever. But uh, but Shazam 2, I mean, uh, come on, that's a... a that's got to be a way worse movie than Ant-Man and Quantumania. Uh, I actually, uh, you know was able to watch Ant-Man and Quantumania, or Ant, sorry, Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania. Now, uh, looking at a sequel to Shazam, I had no interest whatsoever. Well, it, 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 it's kind of funny that you say that, and I'll bring up a category. Um, you know, later there's two categories left. Uh, you have Worst Director, uh, Rise Freight Waterfield for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Mm-hmm. Again, like I've said, yeah. take it for face value. Lowest hanging fruit on the yeah. list, sure. You have David Gordon Green, the Exorcist Believer. Mm-hmm. You have Peyton Reed, Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have Scott Waugh for Expendables. And then you have Ben Wheatley, Meg to the Trench. Again, I don't know why this movie's even on here. Yeah, it makes, it makes no sense, clearly. Uh, wow. Just watch it for what it is. And you know, I, I googled this really quick just to just to look uh, while you were talking about it. Bob, do you want to guess the budget for Winnie the Pooh: Blood and Honey? Twenty thousand dollars. A hundred thousand. So one hundred thousand uh, dollars. Definitely the lowest budget of any movie on that list. Um, but I would like to point out that it grossed uh, five point two million. So suck it, Razzies. Um, they're making a lot more money than you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, yeah, they definitely <laughs> right? made their money back. Yeah, exactly. And then some. Yeah, so uh, to think that there won't be a sequel to that, uh, go screw yourself. You're getting a second one. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, worst screenplay, you have The Exorcist Believer. Mm-hmm. You have Expendables. 
You have Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Mm-hmm. You have Shazam, Fear of the Gods. Mm-hmm. And then you have Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, where is the Flash? Yeah, I mean, God, what that a convoluted piece of shit, bad. you know? <laughs> yeah, made no narrative sense whatsoever, and uh, wow. And, and on top of that, we had to look at Ezra Miller twice the amount of time. So, yeah, whoever decided that was a terrible, terrible And person. then, I mean, you're shitting all over Ant-Man and the Lost Quantumania. Which was a good movie. But, you know, you don't have a worse screenplay. I'm... I'd like to meet the guys who come up with this list. Uh, again, Bob, you have those film snobs who only want uh, snobbish films. Now, uh, we've already hit you know, our, our mark for news, but I do just really, really quick. We don't have to comment on every one of these or anything, but I do want to run over the uh, the Academy Award uh, nominations for, uh, for... How many have we actually seen? Or, or sorry, the Oscar uh, Awards. How many have we actually seen? <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. Um... Uh, Best Picture, American Fiction, Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. Uh, Yeah, the only thing I've seen on there is the Barbie movie. Uh, (laughs) uh, That's the only thing on there I would watch, uh, and I actually didn't love it. So Yeah, um, which, uh, yeah, Buddy Mine said it was just okay. Yeah, I I agree. Um, it, It was... It wasn't as great as I, as I had been hearing, and I, I championed for it. You know, I really wanted it to be good. So. And it was a very message-heavy movie. Sure, uh, yeah, sure. Um, but that doesn't bother me. It's just, yeah, About it wasn't a, a great plot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, best Actor, Bradley Cooper for Maestro, uh, Coleman Dominigo uh, for Rustin, Paul Giamatti, The Holdovers, uh, Cillian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction, Best Actress, Annette Bening, Lily Gladstone, Sandra Huller, Casey Mulligan, or sorry, Carrie Mulligan and Emma Stone. Uh, Best Supporting Actor, Sterling K. Brown, Robert De Niro, Robert Downey Jr., Ryan Gosling, Mark Ruffalo. You know, the same names you see on this every, every time. Uh, Best Supporting Actress, Emily Blunt, Danielle Brooks, America Ferreira, Jodie Foster, Divine Joy Randolph, Best Director, Jonathan Glazer for Z- uh, The Zone of Interest, Your Ghost, I, I'm sorry, Bob, I, I can't even say that name, for Poor Things, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, Martin Scorsese, <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon, and uh, Justine Tourette for Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, I won't go over international or animated uh Adapted Screenplay, American Fiction, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest, Best Original Screenplay, Anatomy Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Maestro, May, December, Past Lives. And um, yeah, I, again, there's there's not too much here uh, uh, else to go over. I think that's, mm. that's good enough. But um, again, you know, with the exception of, of Barbie, you're just getting like these really pretentious movies over here. I'm not really seeing anything that's you know even on my list to ever watch. Now uh, I now one of the one of the movies you named up for uh, best picture. Mm-hmm. I did mean to see in theaters, mm-hmm. but I never did. I wanted to see Oppenheimer so bad, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but you're that's in your wheelhouse. You know you like things like that. Um, I'm I'm not going to be interested in something as. Uh, uh, look, I don't need to be reminded of like nuclear holocaust right now. I'm good on that. But <laughs> plus, I, I just think Cillian Murphy is a good actor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. I, well, I, I can agree with you there. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> a good actor. Uh, but yeah. Bob, uh, I think it's about that time we take a quick break. We'll return with some of the new books that dropped this week. And welcome back to episode number 55 of the film cast. I mean, uh, the all new, all different number one comics podcast. I mean, we had to switch it up one of these episodes. Yeah, sure. So we did. We can say we did it. Cross that off the list. Uh, Bob, there's some new books that dropped this week. There's not a whole lot. Yeah. Just like news, not a whole bunch of books that dropped this week. And on top of that, our comic book shop was a little bit shorted due to some storms up north. Or yeah, up there's, west there's, or just, there's just been so much, you know, bad weather up mm-hmm. north, you know. Um, you know, multiple, multiple inches of snow, and it's just made the conditions on the road, you know, horrible. So, I mean, I, I definitely don't want anybody to get hurt. So, I think, you know, Diamond made a good decision. Okay, 
they're going to be delayed. Yeah, uh, and and you know, uh, just think about that for a second, kids. The comic book industry, you know, looks out for you. Uh, they want to make sure that you're not out there delivering mail, not transporting it, and all of that, getting into car wrecks, slipping on ice, whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, um, your uh, local uh, uh, courthouse is not going to offer you that same uh, protection <laughs> because if they want to send you a jury duty notice, you're getting it. Don't worry. So, um, uh, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles, if it's time to renew, uh, they're sending you that of notice. Course, uh, they want their th- yeah, uh, your mortgage company, absolutely sending you that invoice. But you know, the comic book industry doesn't want you to get hurt. So, See, uh, I mean, comic book industry <laughs> looks out for you. Absolutely. Everything so, else, federal government, eh, yeah, not really. Yeah, they don't care too much. Uh, but uh, with that being said, some new books this week. Bob, uh, we had from What Not Slash Massive, Crash Down Number 1. <laughs> Bob, I'm going to, you know, I'm a hater. Uh, we already know this. I'm going to say this on Front Street. Uh, the concept sounds okay. You know, it sounds like a nice sci-fi book. Um, and whenever I look at the artist, Ben Templesmith, I know it will be illustrated very, very beautifully. But then you look at the guy it's written by. Yeah, this is written by Comic Tom 101, uh, who's, that's, you know, that's the name he's going by. And Fire Guy Ryan. So some great pen names there, you know. Uh, I, I can't, wow. Um, sorry, this it, Look, like you said, you'll eat crow if, you know, whatever. I forgot what you would say it for Jason earlier. Jason Statham if, wouldn't announce Sure, it. Jason Statham. Um, yeah, if this book is any good, you know, from a story perspective, from the writing perspective, I'll eat crow as well, gladly. Um, I'm not doubting that it's going to look amazing because, I mean, you spent your money. Yeah, you got Ben Templesmith. I mean, shit. He's one hell of an illustrator, one hell of a painter. Uh, I mean, just go back and look at those 30 Days of Night books. Look at uh, Gotham by Midnight. I mean, there's beautiful, beautifully illustrated stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no possible way that Comic Tom, the most annoying thing in comics, <laughs> can tell a story. Uh, I'm sorry to say it. Uh, I, I, I I vote against that. But, or um, his partner. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ryan Fireman. Yeah, whatever Fireman. Yeah, uh, not not too into this, but um, hey, whatever. Do your do your thing. I guess mm-hmm. I guess you got to write off your name somehow. Um, from Image Comics in association with Ghost Machine, the new uh, imprint. There we have a sixty-four page premiere introducing, sorry, premiere issue introducing the new shared universe of Ghost Machine. So Ghost Machine number one dropped today, and look, sixty-four pages, still only like a four ninety-nine cover price. So pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, from DC, we got Harley Quinn, issue 36, the uh, backup fantasy tale envisions Harley Quinn as Harley the Barbarian. So, definitely. Who's, who's that supposed to pair? Yeah, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, you know, maybe Indiana Jones. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely pick that up if you're into DC spec. I'm not. You know, those don't ever pan out very well. But, hey, whatever. Uh, from Dynamite Comics, we got a new uh, Darkwing Duck spinoff. This is Justice Ducks, number one premiere issue uh this is one of the books that was missing in our shop bob so we got to go back and pick that up but um had some cool covers on this one there's a cool like uh negative space cover that came out and stuff uh, I'm, I'm sure it's fun we we both enjoyed that darkwing duck book so i'm sure this is probably okay uh we got issue number from marvel comics issue number four and steve orlando who uh if you go back to the bonus episode that i just published this morning did a great interview with steve orlando especially about miguel o'hare spider-man 2099 um, so we talked a lot about that and uh, his his uh, process on, on doing that and how he got the book and everything. But um, uh, the penultimate issue, uh, issue number four of this is out today. It's got the first team appearance of the new Terror, Inc. And let me tell you, like when I talked to Steve about this, like most of his passion went into, uh, of course, he's a huge, huge fan of 2099 i mean Mm -hmm. ask the guy anything about 2099 knows everything about it uh very well versed in it and and everything like that but also he was like i love you know ravage 2099 i love this i love this uh you know i always wanted to see a terror 2099 and and i got to create one you know he's a very big on terror inc like he he really likes it a lot so 
uh, I think Tarek is in good hands here in this Terra 2099. And and I expressed to him, of course, in that conversation, you know, how uh, Man-Thing is my favorite character. And next week he's dropping the uh, Man-Thing one. So he was like, all right, uh, no pressure, I guess. And I said, Do you, <laughs> I, I, it's you. I know you'll nail it. So I'm not worried. But uh, yeah, we did talk about that. Please check out that interview. Um, uh, from DC Comics, Penguin number six, the origin of Batman and Penguin's first encounter Wow, Bob, their first encounter. I can't believe it. You sound um, so thrilled. Yeah, so it. thrilled. Uh, from Marvel, back over to Marvel, another book that I'm super thrilled about, Bob. Power Pack Into the Storm. <laughs> yeah, wow, Power Pack. Uh, this brings back the original creator of Power Pack. Um, a five-issue series where pa the Power siblings take action when their friend Franklin Richards has a premonition of a galactic threat hurtling their way. Scary stuff. Um also from Marvel, we got Punisher 3, the first appearance of Fear Master, a female version of the villain. Uh, we got the Resurrection of Magneto, a four-issue limited series that resurrects Magneto after his death in X-Men Red all the way back in October 2022. Wow, Bob, that was a long time ago. Yes, it was. <laughs> we also got Star Wars Thrawn Alliances number one, a book that I know you're excited oh, about. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. First meeting of Anakin and Thrawn, an adaptation of the 2019 novel of the same name. Bob, I picked up my copy. I don't know what the hell I'm reading, but I do have a copy of it. So just, it just, just know it's Thrawn, written by Timothy Zahn. <laughs> That's all you, you need to know. Thrawn by Zahn. Thrawn by Zahn. That's the tagline. Um, and lastly, uh, again, a book that I didn't see at our local shop. I saw the regular cover, but not this one. We were supposed to have gotten X-Force 48, the John Cassidy variant that uh, may or may not be a, a joke. Uh, we're not too sure, but um, I, I don't know. I didn't get my copy, so I'm May sad. or may not say. be bad. You'll just <laughs> have to find one and see for yourself. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh with that being said, we're going to take another quick break, and when we return, we are going to break down this Saturday morning adventure's Dungeons & Dragons number one. And we are back with episode number 55 of the all-new, all-different number one Dragons & Dungeons podcast. Um, no, that's not right. Dungeons & Dragons. No, uh, all-new, all-different number one comics podcast. That's where we are. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, got a little confused there. It is Saturday morning, and I am on my adventure. Uh Bob, let's talk about the book that we are covering today that is from IDW Comics. That is Dungeons & Dragons, Saturday Morning Adventures 1, of course, with the subtitle inside, something about pirates. I don't know. Here, there's pirates everywhere. Um, Bob, the synopsis from uh, IDW reads, and it's a long synopsis. Uh, Some time has passed since the team's adventure in Waterdeep. Now, Dungeon Master is growing weaker with an unknown ailment. And while thoughts of returning home are never far from their minds, the team must save their mentor and friend. Sailing between planes and their spell jammer, the party finds themselves on the swashbuckling Sword Coast. With Vegger uh, closing in and pirates blocking the way forward, can our heroes cure Dungeon Master before it's too late? Eisner-nominated writer David M. Boer and George... Cambatus, Cambatus, I don't know, that's what I'll go with, are back to kick off a massive plane hopping quest featuring brand new locations and some very familiar faces never seen in cartoon form. Um, so that's the synopsis. Bob, let's talk about the creators for a sec. If you're not familiar with David M. Boer, you are because he did Boom Studios, All New Firefly. He did Canto. If you remember Canto... Uh, he did all of Canto as the creator of that. He wrote on um, Joe Hill's Rain that Zoe Thorgood uh, illustrated. So it was Joe Hill came up with the concept, I think, and then uh, David Boer fleshed it out in story form, and Zoe uh, illustrated. He also did a few issues of Powerless for Vault Comics, as well as Killer Queens for Dark Horse. Uh, Specs, a book that I really liked that came out last year, uh, sorry, in 2022 and last year uh, for Boom Studios, Alien, Bounty Hunter, uh, did some Ghostbusters stuff, done a few things there. Um, so that's our writer of the book and our illustrator, George. Bob, help me with that name there. 
I thought we, I pretty much what you had. I had. okay, okay. So, Cam Battis, uh, could it be Cam Badass? <laughs> um, <laughs> Cam Battis. So George Cam uh, That would be badass. Yeah, really. Um, uh, has has illustrated on Gargoyles, on Firefly, John Carter of Mars, Darkwing Duck, The Flash, Buckhead, The Black Ghost, The Black Ghost Season Two. Uh, I Can Sell You a Body, Grave Lilies, The Vampire Diaries, The Nasty, Speed Force, uh, just a a whole bunch of things that Mm. you probably have read. A lot of licensed uh, properties as Mm -hmm. well. So those are our creators there. Bob, you know that I skipped my synopsis on this one because it was just... It was not fun to write, so I didn't write it. Um, which you know, it's our podcast, and we can do that sometimes if we yeah. want. I guess, right? We can switch up the format. Uh, yeah. Why not? Uh, so, Bob, let's get into the review. I'm going to let you lead uh, with <laughs> story beats. How did you feel about the beats of the story? Um, I, th- I, you know, honestly, I thought the story beats flowed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had the whole, you know, they're, they're searching. Um, through the snowy mountains Mm -hmm. or the healing herb. Yep. You know, then they found out, find out that there's, you know, something that could cure dungeon master in a far off land. So they go to that far off land, which is besieged by pirates, Mm -hmm. which eventually the pirates end up shooting the spell jammer down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I thought the, I thought the beats were, I thought the beats flowed. Yeah. I'm with you. They float now. You know as well as I do, the reason I didn't write my synopsis was I just got a little lost in writing it. I think it was too much for me to explain or whatever. It's not because the beats don't work. Um, they do. It's, it's really straightforward. And it does. I think if you strip it back, it kind of plays like a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Um, you know, just a condensed little adventure there. Of course, you know, it's it's continued, but we would expect the story to be continued. But, I mean, it, it does feel like it could be, you know, one of those two-parter mm-hmm. Saturday sure. morning cartoon. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I think the beats worked fine. I didn't see any problems there. Uh, how about the um, dialogue then? Uh, look, I'll I'll go first because I think that for this book, I think I'm viewing this as like an all-ages book. I think there's a little bit too much dialogue in it. Um, I don't think it's really, really heavy or anything. I just think that... You know, if you're trying to reel in some young readers who are maybe into D and D, and then you throw this at them, maybe there's a little bit too much. Now you got those super nerdy eight year olds that don't mind reading like a whole bunch, like that's fine. But uh, some of the kids that might be a little bit more passively into reading, this might be a little bit much for. As an adult, you know, I'm fine with it, uh, but I, I, I think it was a little wordy. Um, and I would also say I think that we could have introduced our characters a little bit better. I know this is a continuation of a story that's ongoing, but uh, the names and stuff didn't really stick with me. Uh, some of the you know jargon that they kind of talk with mm-hmm. their their funny words and mm-hmm. things like didn't stick as well as they probably wanted it to. Um, that's really all I can say about the dialogue. I don't think it was poorly written. I think it was just a little much jammed in here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I. I don't think I could. I think you could have done with half the dialogue, sure, and it's still been good enough. Don't get me wrong; the dialogue that was there mm-hmm. was good because yeah. I mean it was them just, you know, speaking to themselves like they're all on an adventure. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you have the humorous moments, you know, you have the fun, lighthearted moments, but I mean, then you had the you know serious moments like when they have to fight the ice trolls. Now, here's a question that I have, and I don't know if you got this or not. Neither mm-hmm. one of us being big like D&D guys, I don't think. Mm-hmm. I've played a, a, a couple of times, but I don't know about you. I'm not sure your involvement in it. Is this like meta at, to the point where uh, should we be call, should these characters be calling the guy Dungeon Master? You know, like the Dungeon Master is typically like the one who is, you know, while you're playing uh, the game, you know, they're kind of calling the shots there like, they're almost like I don't know if you could equate it to sports like they're like the referee of it or something. They're like well, I, I just you know, and I started reading this comic, and knowing what Dungeons and Dragons is, mm-hmm. I just expected this to go from that world to the real world. Yeah, you know, uh-huh. and show the kids actually playing the game sure. because you know there's kids playing the game. You yeah, know, Dungeon Master. I mean. You know, you got the guy who comes up with the story yep. and all that kind of stuff. And 
then you have the uh, five or six classes. Mm-hmm. So I was I was expecting that. Now, I mean, that's not to say that that won't happen. Sure. Down the line. Maybe yeah, and and I mean I haven't you know even watched like the the newer like Dungeons and Dragons movie that came out and stuff like that. I don't know if that's like very meta or whatever either, but uh, that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, so then, what about the narrative of the story? I'm I'm gonna say it's it's very straightforward. It's a very yeah. Straightforward I mean narrative. the the narrative was basically them looking for a way to heal the dungeon master. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much what it was with. A little bit of danger mixed in. Yeah, and I don't think you can go off the rails in the narrative and something no. like this uh, because, you know, it's supposed to be like an all-ages book. You don't want to confuse your audience and, and all of that. Right. I, I think uh, David has a good uh, lock on, like, how the narrative of, yeah, of a I book mean, like this you, should be. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to, like, like, a whodunit detective mystery. <laughs> no, yeah, it would be a little out there. Um, so what about the world building? I'm, I'm going to say it's a strength here. Uh, definitely you want some world building in a Dungeons and Dragons comic. It's a big oh, yeah. adventure thing and they're like, you know, big set pieces and all of that. Yeah, and... I mean, that's that's the key cell of Dungeons Exactly, yeah. That, that's that's kind of what it's got to make it work. Now, I will say this, and I think I've said this before in a previous uh, uh, episode. I'm not sure what book we were covering, but uh, it, it, the conversation does like come back to mind. I think whenever it comes to all ages books... It's not that I'm not a fan. It's not that uh, there's anything wrong with them. I just, I don't feel like they're always for me. I feel like I want a little bit more whenever I read an Ollie just book. It's, it's a little hard for me to accept. I don't think this was written for me. I don't think that that's a problem. I think that David has clearly uh, demonstrated here that he can tell this story and can tell it well through the dialogue and the narrative of the characters and everything like that. Um, and definitely the world building. I think that it's well constructed. It's it's definitely you know an all ages book. So I have to put that on front street. But um, yeah, to sum up uh, the story, I think that it works fine and it hits every beat that it should. Uh, I'll save my review for the end. But uh, let's get into the art then, Bob. What did you think about uh, George? Right, I think his name is George. Uh, yes, George's art, his character art here. The the. The character art, it just wasn't what, just personally, it's its not just what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yes, each one had their own individual look. Yep. But, I mean, it's just like, you know, Dungeon Dra Dungeons and Dragons is supposed to be, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, an upbeat fantasy mm -hmm. world. And, I mean, for me, this just didn't portray it. Yeah, did you almost like want some different races and stuff in there? Yeah. Like it feels like they're all the same. Like they all seem like very humanoid. Um, they seem different from one another, but they're they're not, you know, alien or anything. Not not saying that Dungeons and Dragons is full of aliens, but it's like, you know, there's, I don't know. You think of like the fantasy element. You're thinking of yeah. like, you know, uh, something like Lord of the Rings ish, where you have like these different kind of characters all mixing yeah, together. Yeah, I mean, even down to, uh, and I won't even try to say his name because I know I'll butcher it. <laughs> But, I mean, he's basically just a human with blue skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like an Avatar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'll say this. I While I don't think that... I, I agree with you. I think I would like to see a mixture of different kinds of characters. But I think that the, the, the artist captured, you know, the characters that they do have here well. I think that uh, they look good. They look very slick and sleek. Um I, I do like the art. I appreciate the art here. It's not as dumbed down as a lot of all ages books are. And that's one thing I'm really not a fan of is when they make them too cutesy. They didn't go that route. This almost seems like a like maybe you could take this and, and make it a 13 plus book, but you don't have to for any reason because there's not anything in here that's, you know, uh, scary to a younger reader. But um, I, I think that the character art works. The only thing in here that, you know, was a little too silly for me was the unicorn. But <laughs> I think all the humans worked fine, and I, I like the look, and I think that they mix in well with, like, the Saturday morning vibe. Mm. Um, how about the backgrounds? Bob, I, I think that, you know, I'm going to go ahead and lead here, and then I'll let you chime in. But I'm going to say this probably does not pass your background test. Um, there's a lot of lack of backgrounds. Uh, when there are backgrounds, they're... I don't know, like very like digital looking or something. Um, they almost yeah, and I mean it, <laughs> it, it, it's basically there's only there's only a couple of colors. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna say 
you know, definitely does not pass the background test for me either. What's there, you know, kind of just looks like something you could pull up on, you know, a Google search or something. There's not anything mm. unique about it. Uh, I, I, I do kind of appreciate the characters, but not, not really the backgrounds. Um, so the locations then, uh, we kind of really have like this islandy area and then this uh, mountainous frozen tundra yeah, wasteland. Yeah, we, we only get maybe two locations. Yeah, we're about in two locations here. Uh, I, I don't know, Bob. Um, the locations I feel like could have stood out a little bit more too. Uh, I'm going yeah, to say. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you. The locations <laughs> are like the background, you know. They could have had more detail, you know. Something that actually stuck out, something that made them look different. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, while the snow effect on the mountains was cool, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there was. It was just kind of boring. Yeah, exactly. I, and I, I hate to say that, but yeah, I'm with you. I think that there's not enough substance there. It's just whatever. Uh, I get that we're focused on the characters, but that's every comic. You're always focused on the characters. Uh, but you have to make you know a compelling scenery, compelling background locations, yeah. and all of that. And uh, while I think you know at the very opening of the book, the first page or two, we get that you know frozen landscape with the glaciers or mountains and everything that's going on and snow and stuff. I like that tone, and then we didn't keep it throughout the book, so right. the focus was shifted right away uh, away from the locations and backgrounds. So. Uh, so there's that. Now the last thing that we're going to ask about here is The Color by John Paul Bove. Uh, Bove, however you might say that. Um, what do you think about the colors? I, I, you know, I did like the colors, especially with the Saturday morning cartoon mm-hmm. vibe they were going for, you know. These, yeah. The bright colors. Yep. But, I mean, even that, they, it, the colors still portrayed, you know, like the... Um, you know, snowy mountains mm-hmm. and the glaciers and then the islands with the um, tan sand and the blue ocean. Yeah, I'm with you. The The colors the colors definitely work here. I, I think that they're definitely a draw of this book. You would you would hope in an all-ages book that the colors really pop, especially. That's pretty important. Um, and, and one thing I'll say before we get to our, you know, summary of it or, or our final thought on it. Um, you know, I just... I, I, I told you I did that kind of bonus episode where I did the interview with Steve Orlando and I attached like a, a review to it. I did a solo review and I did the, the Twilight Zone from 1991, the now comics Twilight Zone. And that was really interesting because we're always doing these, you know, modern books and you go through the credits of a modern book and you have like usually a writer, an illustrator, a color, and then a letter. Um, that's usually the components of that. It was really interesting and kind of nice going back to that older style book and there's an inker, a penciler, you know, that kind of thing. They really gave it some depth yep. uh, and that's what some of this lacks to me. Now, it's got the polished slick look of like a Saturday morning cartoon and I get that and I want that. But like that depth that, you know, uh, pencils and then ink on top, you know, and shading and everything, you know, uh, uh gives you it's just lacking in some of this stuff and maybe it's just because it's fresh on my mind but i feel like something like this is really missing something like that yeah i mean there is uh, there is something to be said for doing it the older style Uh i mean it's so easy to do it the new style you know like computer graphics Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff but there is something to be said about looking at a comic and you know it has a separate inker and a separate penciler so you get that, you know, almost 3D effect that stands out. Yep. Yeah. Whereas, and, whereas you know, computer graphics, you don't. Yeah, sure. And and I think this just kind of illustrates that point. Uh, forgive me for the pun. Um, but, uh, Bob, I, that brings us to the thesis of the podcast. Is this enough to draw you in? Is this enough to have you recommend issue number two to our listeners? Okay. My answer is twofold. I'm kind of mm-hmm. cheating here. <laughs> Fair enough. It's your podcast. Do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be, I won't be, you know, going on the issue two. This mm-hmm. just didn't do enough for me. Yep. But like I said, I think this book would be really good if you had a prior knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. So if you're a D and D fan, then you'll want to continue this book. You know, it's funny because I I thought about my review, you know, throughout this. And, of course, before we recorded when I was reading the book and everything. Um, and when I tried and failed to write my synopsis. Uh, 
I, I think that David is a really good writer. I've read, uh, you know, quite a few of his things. They're well written. Even, you know, an all ages book like Canto um, is, is written well. And, and uh, you know, I'm able to read that and everything. Uh, like I said, you know, before I, I had a little disclaimer there where I said this, this book is not quite for me because it's an all ages book. And uh, those sometimes are hard for me to get through, uh, hard for me to be invested in, especially the characters. I will say this. I, too, will not add this to my pool. I'll not be continuing on to issue number two. There's not enough there for me. Now, like you said, if you're a huge fan of any of these components, if you're, I don't know, a 12-year-old kid, if you're really, really big into D&D, &D, if you just love the look of, like, Saturday morning cartoons in the early 2000s or whatever, yeah, I mean, this is definitely worth a read. It's fun. Uh, it's it's a fun like little adventure and if you haven't seen a lot of these things already you know these stereotypical adventures uh, you know uh, here or there be pirates types of things or whatever and this is your introduction to that it's probably a lot of fun uh, I'm a 40 year old guy and I've seen stuff like this way too many times and it's just kind of uh, cliche to me at this point so I I'm not invested you might be it's not a bad comic by any means. I think it's done well. It's just not for me personally. So I'm going to leave that at the door there. Uh, you know, take your pick. If you're huge into D&D &D or any of those components, pick it up. If you're more like me and you're like a 40-year-old jaded dude who doesn't, uh, you know, who wants to tell the kids to get off your lawn, then don't pick it up. But um, <laughs> that's uh, me and Bob's take on it. So, uh let us know if you uh, disagree with that take or not. We'd love to hear your uh, thoughts on the book. We are going to take a quick break and we'll return in just a moment. And here is part two of the Steve Ekstrom interview. Enjoy. So it's in, in that you see that a lot. And we've, I think comics right now are at an, at a point, a turning point where people are really fickle with their money. And yeah. because economic constraints and things like that, you don't have people spending the kind of money they used to spend because they're either broke or they've moved on to video games or they've moved on to streaming content that they're consuming voraciously. And you have, I don't want to get into politics, but you have a mindset with your, your standard demographic that doesn't match up with the people making the books. Yes. And so people's personal stuff gets in the way of being able to buy a book. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's unfortunate. Um, you have to be able to suspend your disbelief. And I think that polarization that we talked about prior to the show is affecting the market deeply in, in a much more insidious, passive way than we've ever recognized. And while I'm not saying don't tell stories that are progressive, I'm saying that there, there has to be a balance in storytelling where you understand that there are people from all walks of life engaging this material mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that, you know, yes, we want to give voice to people, you know, um, representation matters. Uh, all those things are important. You know, um, my kid's trans. So it's like, uh, I wrote before he came out, um, as trans, he was non-binary. So mm -hmm. I made an effort in one of my projects to make one of the characters non-binary and to try to normalize that person just for their, their own personhood, just yeah. for their existence in, in the grand scheme of our lives. It's not, you know, tab A, slot B every day. It, it, there's complexity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's getting kind of, I'm babbling away into a tangent, but it's, it's um, with storytelling and how to engage your readers, there really, there needs to be the safety of good constructs, the safety of, of well-worn tropes or, or themes, but, and, and that's, there's only like Shakespeare only came, like, I think they came up with like eight conflicts uh -huh. that you can have in stories. So <laughs> we have these time honored things that are constructed into the things we make, but it's like, how do you, how do you take a cube and turn it on its side? So it mm. looks, it's still a cube, but it looks different. And yeah. that's what we're doing as a storyteller. And I think that when you have people telling especially licensed content where we have to have approvals and you have to, you know, make sure again, you're not making tacos out of this hot dog stand yep. that you are focused on mainly just entertaining people. And, and it, but it's, it's, it's weird. Like 
I competed in Zuda. Do you do you know what Zuda was? Uh, DC no, had a web comics brand in like the early, in the mid aughts, like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Okay. Um, it was a web comics engine that was kind of like uh, America's Got Talent, or uh, <laughs> okay, and, and people voted on it was you know people voted on your comics, mm -hmm. and and I I went through a hard time with that because I had this really cool concept. It was like um, it was Johnny West meets the Manchurian Candidate from Outer Space. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That is a cool concept. Yeah, Johnny Quest. He was like a superpowered Johnny Quest mm -hmm. that had like Martian DNA implanted in him that made him like a supercomputer. Wow. And it was weird. And it was it was just a cool, weird thing that I did with a Swedish cat uh, named Mikhail Bergfist, who he had drawn this comic book, and I just was basically mad libbing his old comic book into a new story. <laughs> wow. And it got kind of wordy. Yeah. And the big the big problem that I had was I ran into TLDR in a comic mm -hmm. book yeah people were like there's too much to read here and i was kind of like fuck you the next eight pages <laughs> has like no words a bunch of gunshots and al you know albino crocodiles <laughs> who cares yeah but there is a balance um i think warren ellis um has a book about making comics and and like him and grant morrison can argue that an average comic book page can have anywhere between like 250 and 300 words on it and you you find comics now that don't even have like twenty. No, yeah. And, and it's and it, it the thing that I as a as a guy who makes these things and a, as a guy who has to you know want people to buy them, you have to tell a story that's got words to it. Yes. You know, and you can't have these deconstructed things that are so slow and there's no there's no movement because there's no story to read. Mm -hmm. That an average comic book in the year two thousand took seven and a half minutes to read. Wow. If, if you're and, and like it's still about the same. But if you're reading a book that you spend six to eight dollars on in two minutes, we failed you. Mm -hmm. We failed mm -hmm. you as storytellers completely. And so like I like I I'm like I said, I'm gonna let you take a look at the fog before it comes out. Um and I'm gonna I can't wait, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh it like it's it's wordy. It's it, there's a lot of dial, but I'm showing you a story and I'm I'm not expositing. I'm mm -hmm. pushing the agenda of the story through characterization. So I think that there's, you know, you have different kinds of writers telling different kinds of stories, but mm -hmm. I think the key to telling a good, solid indie comic story is just having something mm -hmm. be proficient, be competent. Like there are so many indie comics. And I think this is another reason why retailers are struggling where they're, they're having to take risks buying these indie comics mm -hmm. And the indie comics aren't put together well. Yeah. There's a lot of toilet paper out there. And and that's, I, again, like I'm probably inviting criticism here. But when you see retailers taking gambles so that they can have a business, and I'm from a small town in Georgia, so there's only one low volume store. And mm -hmm. this guy's been open for like 25 years. Wow. But it can get scary because... He he can only order as many people as a small town can support. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you can't take risks on big indie books. Like at, I remember starting to read Walking Dead in like the 30s, mm -hmm. and he only ordered like five copies of it, and it was wildly <laughs> popular. But because we lived in a small town, the five dudes who got out of town every once in a while were the dudes reading it, yep. and me. Mm -hmm. So we added a sixth book. So if that tells you anything, but like now it's like I go to this store, I live in the, you know, a bigger area of South Florida. I go into this store that's like 9,000 square feet. They have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in monthly comics on the shelves, which is amazing. Yeah. But you still have to remember that like we're looking at two to 400 stores shutting down every year at this point. That's mm -hmm. not okay. No. So like a, a focus on quality is so important. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's really cool that you point that out. Uh, Bob and I talk about that a lot on the podcast, a lot, a lot, a lot. Now, it's not that we, you know, swing either way, like uh, we, we're looking for a wordy or, or super dialogue driven book or we're not. Um, but you're right. There's a sweet spot there. Uh, you know, some writers uh, use a, a lot of dialogue in their books. Uh, some some writers don't. You know, it just depends on their style and, and what story they're trying to tell. But uh, if, if you can't convey that information, uh, you know, uh, 
to to the artist you're working with, um, you know, and they can't tell a compelling story through the art. Um, and there's so much exposition on the page, you know, and it just gets so bogged down and heavy with that. Uh, then it's then it's not a fun read, you know. That that happens quite a bit, uh, you know. And on the flip side of that, if uh, if it's a beautiful beautiful book and there's it's very sparse with dialogue and there's hardly anything in there and there's no real uh, you know content to the book and it's just a, a gorgeous looking book. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you. I love art, but I'm not signing up for like a, a silent issue, you know, like an art book. A, a lot of times I want substance and story in that as well. So so you're right. Like there is a very thin line there that you have to walk as a creator and and uh, make sure that you're, you know, you're satisfying both ends of that while playing to your strengths. Oh, yeah. I, I was really fortunate to get to work with Marco Federa on, on this book. Um, yes. He is a just hell of a storyteller and he's his <laughs> artwork is gorgeous like mm -hmm. i tell a lot of people and, and I, I this is lofty praise and, and i've told marco this himself i'm like you're like the jim lee of italy you know? <laughs> and, and that's what i feel like <laughs> when i see his stuff and it's just so gorgeous and it, it evokes like jim it evokes like Stuart eminem it evokes like all these master artists and he's just you know doing his thing every month and it's like i can't wait for people to, to be introduced to his work more because he's his work is stunning so to have him kind of telling my story we we both are huge carpenter nuts i tend to be i i do full scripting i'm not this marvel method guy where i'm, I'm like letting the artist guess what i'm picturing in my head so mm -hmm. it's very framed out i think very cinematically i watch a ton of film <laughs> and read a ton of books and it's so it's like I think in pictures. So it's it's so I can kind of cater to this guy's strengths. I've looked at his art before we started working together. So I could take the time and go, this guy's really good at X, Y, and Z. So let me make sure he has plenty of X, Y, and Z. Yes. And then I'll fill it up with dialogue. And then I this is something I literally try to do in every comic book I ever write. I try to put a nine panel grid into everything. Wow. <laughs> as a as a exercise in sequential storytelling. And, and, and like, I, I find that there is a lot of people, there are a lot of creators who don't understand the key component of sequential art, which is rising action and falling action. The mm -hmm. whole thing is that this is supposed to be working in the reader's brain. So panel one is a cop drawing the gun out of his jacket. Panel two is him kicking a door in. You understand that between panel one and panel two, he's pulled his gun out and kicked that fucking door in. Yep. And you've got people that don't know how to do that. Yes. And they'll like, I've read scripts from samples from people or just things I've had to edit where they're like describing movement in a, in one panel. And I'm like, uh -huh. you can't describe that, that nobody can draw that. Nobody <laughs> can draw a guy doing three things unless they do one of those panels from like the seventies where it shows like Spider-Man flipping in the background. And then yep. there's like a little, another version and another version and they get darker and darker and darker, <laughs> darker as you get closer. That's the only way you can do that. And it's, it is frustrating um, because I, again, I don't, I, I don't want to disparage anybody, but it's, you know, I've studied these things for a long fucking time and you, you want to tell people the best story you can tell them and you can't do it. If one of your cylinders on your engine is not pumping in unison with the other five. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bob and I have done so many books and, and, you know, I never, I never uh, want to be mean to any creators. You know, everybody is, uh, you know, working hard and, and you know, uh, finding their groove and, and all of that. So I, I'll never, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to call out anybody by name and I won't say names of books or anything like that. But, you know, for the most part, uh, we're overwhelmingly very excited about the books that we cover. Uh, we don't do, we try not to do any research or anything. Like we try not to even read synopsis. We just put like four random books on a wheel, you know, of, of new number ones that are coming out that we can spend. Cool. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's different. And then, you know, we, uh, we very openly, you know, just, uh, break down the story and then the art and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's been a few times, you know, there's been a good uh, five or six where we just couldn't get into it for one reason or another. And, and a lot of times it's that disjointedness, you know, that takes place. It's that uh, you got a really strong writer here who's who's really telling a great story. Uh, but you're teamed up with this artist who, who, who can't convey that in the art or, or vice versa or whatever. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're teaming somebody up now, take somebody like Tyler Crook, who's writing and illustrating his own book. Uh, 
uh, Lonesome Hunters, uh, The Wolf Child, you know, that just uh, ended recently or, or uh, the series proper before that. And obviously he doesn't have to do that with himself. You know, he, he's, he's taking it from, from all angles and, and really uh, putting that story out there and, and it works, it fires on every cylinder, you know, it's perfect. And yeah, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, you know, looked at books where you've had a writer artist and yep. you either have a guy that is completely focused on all the moving parts yes. or you have a guy that's blinded by his own work. And yes, that, yes. There's blind spots in all kinds of work when you have a writer artist where mm -hmm. like, and this is a guy that's less experienced than say somebody bigger, like Howard Shaken or, yes. you know, yeah, like yeah. Somebody massive like that. Mm -hmm. So this guy is learning and it's like, you're like, Hey man, we can't use this page because it's, you know, there are technical issues with the printing or whatever, but you could change this and this to make these two pages work together. And then we can figure out something else. And it's there's there's lots of moments like that in indie comics where it's a learning process and you yes. have people that are I mean, there's there are you can go buy any book by Peter David or Brian Bendis or whoever the Stan Lee How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way book. <laughs> you can read those books all you want, but the real way to get the experience. And that's that's really the only way you can do it is yeah. to learn how to make comics the hard way and make mistakes. Um, my first story that I published in 2007, 2008, I have lettered it six times in over the 15, 20, you know, 20 years that it's been in existence. <laughs> and it's like every time I, I, you know, level up in my skills as, as a letterer writer, I see technical development that I can change and mm -hmm. I just re-edit my own work. And to be able to self-edit is, is a really important skill. And I think it's one that if you don't learn it, you wind up butt hurt a lot by yeah. it, because like when you work at a bigger company that has an editor on a book, they're looking for something specific and they're going to drive that content and they're going to have you rewrite things. But when you work at like a smaller indie company, there's it's there's the budgets on the books are modest. Mm -hmm. The amount of time we have to produce these modest books is small. So there isn't a lot of time to go back and fix things. You have to shoot your shot and you got to yeah. be accurate. And there are times when, you know, I'll get an email and be like, hey, man, I need you to letter this book like in the next, you know, the next day and a half so that we can get it to the printer. And sorry, it's late, but somebody was late along the chain because it's indie comics and because, you know, <laughs> everybody's hustling to pay their rent and eat and, pay, you know, their kid needs to go to the doctor or whatever. So there are all kinds of facets to these things that nobody sees when the saw how the sausage gets made. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard. And those books that you buy to learn how to do things, they're more about templates and, and you should pay attention to those. Like yeah. you would be surprised how many people can't write a proper script. Mm -hmm. You know, like I write in full script and it took me years to learn my process and looking at other people's scripts and yep. things like that. But it's there are so many things in comics that only get better the more you immerse yourself and try. And I think it reflects in the work. And I think that's where you see people graduate. Like Marco Federa, I, like, again, I was blessed to get to work with this guy. And he agreed, you know, to work on this for a set amount of money because he was a Carpenter mm -hmm. fan. And because I gave, I let him read my, and he was, oh, I love this. And, <laughs> and I was just like, I love you. You know, and it was just kind of the, uh, did we just become best friends? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we get to work with an, a guy that worked with me on, on Soko, um, um, Emilio Leche, um, a fantastic colorist. And then I'm lettering the book. So I get to self-edit. Yep. And so I get the book on both ends. I get to hand it to somebody who draws it. I get to kind of look over his art with him. If there's something wonky, we pull it. Then the colorist gets it. And there's sometimes there's color corrections. And I get to kind of say, hey, man, this, this person's hair is blonde in this thing. And you got it brown. And then, you know, or we'll, you know, we'll lift something out with color by coloring over something that didn't seem to fit or had like wonky texture or proportion to it. And then I get to letter it. And then I get to trim my own work and make sure that I'm not inundating you with like exposition. Like that's the, I, the biggest thing I hate as, a, as an editor and as a writer is that there are a lot of people in, in writing period who do. So I went to the store today and then the, Character two says, oh, yeah, you went to the store. What did you get? And it's like, <laughs> that is so unnecessary. Yep. And like, 
it, it's it's like the scene from Forty Year Old Virgin, where they're in the light, and he's like, she's like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "What are you doing?" And it's, <laughs> it just goes back and forth like that. And it's a waste of your time. It's a waste mm -hmm. of your, you only have so much space in between all these panels and this beautiful art. Make everything count. Yep. So. Sorry, yeah, I and get off my soapbox. I sound no, like you're fine. Creator. <laughs> you're good. You're good. I mean, that's look. Look, if nothing else, that's you know what the people are, are tuning in for. You know, they definitely want to hear uh, the process. You know, that's that's very important to a lot of our listeners. Uh, we do have a lot of you know at the very least, uh, at the very lowest level, you know, aspiring creators. I, I've, I've spoken to quite a few of our uh, listeners who who say. Hey, can, you know, I'm trying to get into comics. I'm trying to learn how to write comics or I'm trying to illustrate or uh, even letter, you know, things like that. Uh, next time you interview a creator, can you ask them this and this? So, so they sure. really do love to hear uh, all of that stuff that's out there. Um, it is, it's definitely much appreciated. Usually uh, that's on my list of questions that I ask, you know, <laughs> do you have anything to say to aspiring creators? But um, yeah, and, and, and if you do, please feel free. But <laughs> um, the main thing I would tell you is that if I had to tell anybody anything, it's learn to drive the car before you think you can drive the Ferrari around. <laughs> yeah. Learn learn to drive a car. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do things in a simple manner before you think you can do something elaborate because sure. you're just setting yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the unfortunate mediums, uh, artistic mediums, where like, and, and this is not to shit on fans or any, or book readers, but, I, and I used to do this too, before I was, you know, tried to write anything. People stand around going, I can do this better than the guy who's paid to do it. Oh yeah, and absolutely. The first thing you need to do is humble yourself because mm -hmm. there are people who've been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years who are master storytellers who have taken the time to learn how to do it. And it's not easy. And, I, and, and it's very, uh, it's insulting to hear people kind of like, oh, this isn't hard. I can do that. Mm -hmm. That's bullshit. No, you can't. And you, you, maybe you will, you'll get lucky, but I can assure you that your first outing is not going to be a good time. Yeah. And it, like people who, who are good readers tend to be better writers Mm -hmm. because they've read enough. Like, I think the, the Anton Chekhov once said, like, in order to write one good story, you must have read, you've had to have read a thousand books. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, think about that. That's yeah, and, and that makes that's sense, the, you know? That's the yeah. grandfather of the mo of the modern short story. Yep. And, you know, literary-wise. And, uh, you know, he's onto something. Like, I'm not going to tell you that I'm, I'm a fucking master. Like, mm -hmm. I learn something new every day. I, I am a novice, and I want to be a forever student of comics. I yep. want to always learn and, and improve and develop and just matriculate as I tell stories. So uh, that's the one thing. I, I humble yourself, learn how to do something the right way first, and then mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, and and really stellar advice. I mean, I think you know that's uh, definitely on a level where you know anybody could comprehend that. Uh, you and and it's it's simple advice in a way, but at the same time, it's, it's so overlooked, you know, it's, it's not something that people think about. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you've got an idea and you just want to jump in, you know, into the deep end, uh, or, or whatever that saying is. And like, and no, I mean, you're right. You should be able to tell a compelling story. Now I, I always think this, if you don't have like an elevator pitch or a log line that makes sense, like you should probably, you know, take a step back, uh, reevaluate what you're doing because, to me, there's like such a lost art in that, you know, you should be able to say uh, this story is about a, a guy and a girl who fall in love. And then, uh, you know, one of them dies and, and then this happens like whatever, you know, but sure. there should be like, it should be very simple for you to say something like that. The problem, like, I think that's the opposite. There are tons of idea people. Like mm -hmm. most of my adult life has been, Oh, I've got an idea for you. You can write <laughs> this in your book. And I'm like, no, no, thanks. <laughs> but everybody's got an idea. They yes. don't know how to execute. And the mm -hmm. executing part, I, I'm, I am a, um, if I don't know how to do something, I tell you. Like it's, sure. it's painfully honest to live in that headspace, but I am not a fake it till you make it person when it comes mm -hmm. to things like, like making something. <laughs> if I don't know how to do it, I learn how to do it. And I'll make mistakes and I'll tell you I'm making mistakes. And I, and I have to live in that headspace, but they're like, we, because of the internet culture, I think because of the, the illusion of social media that we 
are these, you know, dialed up to 11 versions of ourselves. Yep, People absolutely. pretend to do things and some get lucky and they fail up. Good for yep. you. I don't <laughs> ever want to be one of those people because those are the people who burn out yeah. because th somebody eventually figures out, Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's fucking talking about. <laughs> and then yeah. you could be as powerful and as wealthy as you want to be. But when people figure out that you're the emperor wearing the emperor's clothes, your credibility has gone. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to hire you again. Nobody's going to trust you. You have to be trusted to make art and you have to be trustworthy and talented and, you know, a student of a craft to do that. I think. Like, or you can have an obscene amount of money and just make shit. But <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that I definitely not, exists in our society. That guy. <laughs> yeah. that guy, I don't have you and me both. Money. <laughs> yeah, uh, you and me both. Um, now, uh, look, I've taken about an hour of your time here, so oh. I, I I won't go too much longer. Uh, well, I I do have, you know, one last question before we kind of wrap up, and then I ask you to plug your socials and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, and and this is kind of uh, you know picking backing on on what we talked about before, especially with the uh, you know Sumerian and, and massive working together and everything like that. Um, you know, it seems like uh, as far you guys have been lucky so far. You know that uh, like you are able to do something that you're very very passionate about here, uh, the fog. You know, something that you really care a lot about. And I want to tie that back in. You know, uh, and we'll say this towards the end and everything too, and throughout. The, you know, I'll. I'll, I'll I'll intercut it throughout the interview or whatever, but, um, you know, th this is about the fog, you know, the fog is coming out, uh, February 28th, I think. No. Yeah. Um, okay. February 28th. Thank I, sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't I have that information in front of me. Multiple times. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so February 28th, that'll be in your local comic book shop. So you still, uh, got just a, a tiny bit of time before FOC. So you definitely, uh, need to, uh, you know, first and foremost, hit up your your uh, local comic book shop and let them know you want that added to your pool. That's the best thing you can do to make sure you secure a copy of this. Don't sit there and hope they're going to order like 500 copies. You you might get to the shop and, you know, they're sold out and then you're going to be pissed. So uh, make sure you let your local comic book shop know uh, to, to pre-order this. Um, uh, but, but you, you've been lucky, you know, enough to, to do something you're passionate about. I know Sam was very passionate about, uh, about, uh, basic instinct, uh, a favorite movie of his and something that he had, you know, uh, stories in his head, you know, for all this time. And then he, 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 you know, kind of approached you guys about writing the comic. Um, I don't know about Michael because I've not spoken to Michael. I don't know if he's a huge American psycho guy or not. Uh, uh, but, um, he's talented. And he's, yeah. <laughs> he's a good time. He's a very yeah. smart, I think you'd have a good time interviewing him. Uh, I'll, I'll have to get him on the cast. I definitely love to talk to him, especially, uh, you know, that artwork with uh, Piotr there. Uh, yeah. Phenomenal. Uh, he, he did work on All Eight Eyes, which is a book that me and my co-host absolutely uh, just, you know, love. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I definitely am not asking you to, to spill the beans to say anything more about any other projects that are up and coming, but, you know, how are you guys selecting these creators or, or, or sorry, you know, rather, how, how is the publisher selecting these creators, pairing them up with these projects? Is, is it a lot of pitching that the creators are doing themselves and trying to grab that license? Like, how is that working for Sumerian and Massive? It, it, there's a lot of there's there's more than one way to roam, more than one mm -hmm. ro road into Rome. Okay. And um, there are pitches, there is networking, there is just being in the right place at the right time. Sure. Um uh, that happened for me on at least mm -hmm. one project in the last <laughs> year and a half where I was just in the right, like the fog. I was mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time. And I had seen the movie. Yes. Um, the, another project I'm working on, nobody was familiar with the band's music. Mm -hmm. I was familiar with them. And because I grew up with their music in every rinky dink pool hall bar in my southern <laughs> sleepy Southern town that I'm from. And yep. so you, you just, some things just line up. Other things, there are technically smart places to be. If, if you're a solid storyteller and you understand the mechanics of storytelling, you can kind of walk into anything if you have a topical knowledge of, of something mm -hmm. and pitch it. I've pitched things that I knew nothing about, but I took the, the two hours to watch a movie. I yep. took, you know, 30 minutes to listen to an album and, and you know, ideas spring forth. Um, so I, a lot of it, a lot of, a lot, a lot of it is being in the right place at the right time and being able to professionally put things together. There's so many people like throw together pitch decks with like generic stuff that actually isn't a story. It's just a, 
they reiterated that they understood what your project is. Mm -hmm. And they get jobs that way because licensors just want somebody that's going to play safe with their their project. They're not going to take any great risks. They want something that could be farmable into new IP. Yep. And so they want kind of these generic loose things that can be developed and they want it again, safe. They don't, they don't want you to do anything wild. They want you to do something very specific or, or something very set, you know, just kind of standard and that's okay. Um, sometimes you work with people who have wild ideas. Uh, we pitched a license that's kind of controversial um, I spit on your grave. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And the guy who's, you know, I'm not bad mouthing this dude, but he, he wanted to play hardball with the license. This was mm -hmm. it with behemoth. And, and like, there are two iterations of his stuff. There's one that a film company made and there's one that he made. Yep. And then he made a sequel to the movie he made that kind of fell in line with the movies that the other company made. It was, mm -hmm. it just modeled. And <laughs> I was like, I don't want to tell this same story again because it's really sexist it's mired in all this controversy what if i elevated it and did something completely different mm -hmm. and the guy loved it but it still fell apart because he wanted to put his weird you know this person wanted to put this licensor wanted to put his stink on it mm -hmm. and so it was just one of these things where like fuck this you know pass <laughs> yeah you know. not gonna work out <laughs> and, it, and it didn't work out and and there's mm -hmm. lots of stuff like that um Hobo with a shotgun. We mm -hmm. we had a pitch for that. And I had this thing called Hobo with a shotgun goes to hell. <laughs> and I wanted to make it, but it never happened. And mm -hmm. things fall apart all the time. You know, like the Peaky Blinders pitch that we put together, they just weren't interested at the yep. time. And, you know, you put things together and you have all this hope and, you know, desire to make something because you're passionate about it or you're a fan of it. Like, I mean, who doesn't want to work at Marvel? that reads comic books who doesn't want to work at DC who doesn't have an X-Men story in them or a Batman story or a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles story or yep. whatever thing that makes you happy. We all have it. And it's just, you know, execution and the will and the want. And if the law of diminishing intent takes it from you or not. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I, I think that's the, you know, well, most kind of inspiring and, and best advice you could get out there. And it, I really like this, uh, you know, this conversation that we're having because, you know, going into this, I, I didn't know that you knew so much about the industry. I didn't know that you were so closely involved with the publisher and everything. So, uh, you know, that we're getting like kind of this golden information out there, uh, you know, for for all of our aspiring creators in the audience and everything. Uh, really, really cool. Uh, really great that they're able to, you know, tune in and, and listen to stuff like this. Uh, you know, the comic book community is such a wonderful community. Uh, something that I spoke about with Sam when we talked, uh, Sam Freeman on, on Basic Instinct, you know, he was like, look, all, all I want to do is just write comic books for a living and have fun. And he's like, uh, please don't take that away from me. This is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. He feels like, you know, uh, you know, we, we related to music before. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, th that thing, like your band's on tour and everybody loves you. You know, it's just like, uh, I, I want this forever. This is so cool. And and, uh, you know, to, to be able to take that uh, that information from from somebody who's got experience in the industry and everything, uh, just really cool. So I, I appreciate you, you know, coming on and, and laying all that down for for all the listeners here. Uh, really, really great stellar information. Um, I do know, uh, you know, please tell us again, um, you know, when. Uh, the book comes out, uh, or, or sorry, that, that is February 28th. February 28th. I, that information. I, I, I can tell <laughs> yeah. you something uh -huh. unique that I haven't announced yet. Oh, please. Yeah. I'm setting up a web store and a website mm -hmm. and I'm going to have a exclusive cover for the fog that I've had commissioned. Oh, wow. So that I can sell it through my website. Very um, cool. A, a number one with artist, um, Drew Ragland. Uh -huh. Um, this guy is painterly in a Bill Sinkovich kind of way. Oh man, and it's really gorgeous, and I will show you that as well in private. But oh. I, this is the first time I've announced this yet. I haven't told people about this other than like close friends and like my mm -hmm. girlfriend. Um, I have, I, I want to make my own variant so that I have a, a, a version of this book that I handled completely. And um, he's just such a brilliant beast of an artist. And I was so happy to meet him in LA a couple years ago, and I kept talking to Ryan. Uh, Swanson, the other co-publisher at at the brand, and I was just like, dude, we've got to rope this guy up. He's so talented, 
and it just never there was no connection because there was just you you find what works and you find what works within your budget and this guy had kind of a certain price amount and it just it like he was not brought into the fold properly and i mm -hmm. felt personally responsible for dropping the ball so i reached out to him and i was like hey man i love your work this is my budget can you do x and he was like yeah and i was just kind of like oh shit i'm gonna have <laughs> a really nice cover from my own web exclusive web store exclusive so it'll be, there'll probably only be like, I'm going to probably do like 150 or 200 like standard, like virgins and then like 50 foils. If I can get the foil covers made with oh, a digital printer. Amazing. And th this thing is, it's, it's a picture of my lead character of Andrew in like the blackest night of a fog. And he's like walking out of a fog with like this massive tactical shotgun. <laughs> and it's just this wow. beautiful shot of this guy walking out of some like really ominous looking pitch black fog. It's just really cool. I can't wait to see that. That That's amazing. <laughs> now, uh, can you plug where that will be available uh, yet? Or, or I, I do building? have a URL. I'm putting okay. like, I'm literally putting this website together like this weekend. Okay. Okay. My, my, my URL is steveextrom.rocks. Okay. Awesome. And that is Steve Ekstrom. That is S T E V E E K S T R O M. So yeah. Dot rocks. Yes. Uh, I wanted Steve Ekstrom dot sucks, but it was like, really <laughs> yeah. was like 75 it, it, bucks a year. Uh, understood. Um, I, I remember a uh, band in high school, we got a uh, URL that was free and it was a, uh, our band name dot is cool dot net. So, um, Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, well. I just, I saw like I was on GoDaddy and, like my girlfriend was like, what do you think of this? And I was like, ah, I don't want this. I don't want that. I had a very specific goal in mind. And then she goes, what do you think about Steve Ekstrom rocks? And I was like, I'd rather have Steve Ekstrom sucks. Cause it's like Primus sucks, you know? Yep. And I was like, let's just make fun of myself. Cause if you can't, you don't need, if you can't handle that, you know, what can you do? But yep. it was just a cute, funny thing. So it looked cool on a business card and on a banner. So, and I'm in the process of like building a new banner for shows and, getting like a table runner and stuff. So I was just like, let's just throw it all into the branding and do the Steve Ekstrom dot rocks thing. Cause it's totally corny and dumb, but it'll <laughs> look cool on a shirt. So yeah. Um, but yes, I am doing my own version of number one, which comes out February 28th. And my, I will be all over social media. Most of my, my branding is Steve dot Ekstrom on mm -hmm. Facebook on, I believe it's that way on instagram uh blue sky i'm not on i'm get trying to get off of twitter because mm -hmm. x or whatever <laughs> elon musk is bastardized into this platform yeah. and i don't really do much there anymore but it's like steve underscore extra there but i that's mm -hmm. because it was before the whole dot thing made sense sure <laughs> this is this is i've had the same like 800 people following me on twitter for like 12 years so i just don't use it but, um, Good. Uh, all of you uh, X, uh, so whatever you call them, uh, members out there, make sure you guys uh, follow yeah, Steve on, follow on X. Followers. So, yeah, that way he doesn't follow. delete his account. So he, Just troll me. I don't even <laughs> care. I'll, I'll just love the attention. So far. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, again, that is The Fog coming out from Sumerian in collaboration with Massive. And that yep. drops on uh, February 28th of this year, 2024. Steve, I cannot wait to see this book. I can't wait to see your variant cover. I'm really, really excited about it. It's going to be amazing. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks for having I really me. It's so hard it. to do press as an indie creator oh, and yeah. to get opportunities to talk at will like this and just to be yourself. And it's like, I actually called my boss. I was like, is there anything I can't talk about? And he was just like, <laughs> don't talk about homophobic stuff or racist stuff. I was like, <laughs> lucky for you, I won't. So... <laughs> you know good makes two of us <laughs> yeah awesome yeah uh thank you so much steve again greatly appreciated and uh hopefully we'll talk again soon i hope so too take care thank you you too man and welcome back to episode number 55 of the all new all different number one comics podcast bob it's about that time yes. that you hit him with the uh, books that are dropping next week. But, first. but of course, before we do that, we have to have disclaimer time with Bob. 
as always, like I said, this is just a few, a handful, maybe, of the <laughs> books that are hopefully coming out next week. Yes. Because we all know the world. Yeah, um, much like we had delays this week, uh, there's a possibility of delays next week. So mm-hmm. you never know, but uh, we do our best. So if you want a more in-depth list, please consult us where, uh, call your local comic shop. They will be glad to tell you all the books that are hopefully coming out next week. And maybe if you're nice, what they're about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Like Bob said, if you are in Jacksonville, Florida, like Bob and I, make sure you stop by Gotham City Limit. Uh, Go see Ben or Jonathan and let them know you want to know every book that's coming out next week. But please, for the love of God, make sure you tell them that Bob sent you. Okay, I'll take the hit on that one. (laughs) So, starting off the list from DC Comics, we have Batman Off-World number three. Bob, Batman is still off-world. We've got... uh, Jason Aaron and Doug Mankey uh, keeping Batman away from the world, which is sad. But this does have a possible first appearance of the Thanagarian, a bounty hunter, uh, not from the Star Wars universe. One of my favorites. Possible. (laughs) It's possible, right? Yes, it's It could happen. Uh, Going to Marvel for a moment, we have Wolverine number 42. Yeah, and this one has a beautiful uh, Laura Kinney, Arthur Adams cover. Um, It's a 1 in 25, though, so look, if you want that one, definitely hit up your local shop uh, now. Don't wait till Wednesday morning. It'll be gone. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Going back to DC, we have DC Power 2024. Yeah, this one is an anthology of stories featuring black DC heroes uh, by various writers and various artists, so uh, that sounds fun. I'm definitely excited to pick up my copy. Uh, Yeah, check that one out. Sticking with DC, we have Batman Superman World's Finest 2024 Annual Number 1. That's a mouthful. Bob, could this be the first Batman Superman World's Finest Annual Issue? It could be. Wow, can't believe it. It could be. It may not be. Who who (laughs) Who really knows at this point? (laughs) Uh, Staying with DC, we have Batman and Robin Annual Number 1. Speaking of annual. Bob, a 48-page oversized issue. That's right. You can stare at Batman and Robin for 48 pages. I feel like to have an oversized issue, it's, you should have 64. Right? You know, I just feel like a 48 is, what, two issues in yeah, one? Yeah, it's just double-sized, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Staying with DC, we have Trinity Special Number 1. Bob, this one's got the first solo title featuring trinity the daughter of wonder woman did she mold her daughter out of clay doesn't look like it but you never know because we do have batman and superman in the background there for no apparent reason so i guess we'll find out because it's dc and you have (laughs) to have batman and superman on the cover somewhere i guess you're right uh going to marvel we have one of our personal favorites spider boy number three yeah, and this one, look, if you haven't read number two yet, uh, Spider-Boy is amazing. A lot of fun. I, I love this character. I love this comic. It's actually much better than it should be. Um, uh, but that's, you know, what happens whenever you get Dan Slott writing your book for you. This one has the first appearance of a toy soldier, a villain. And if it's any indication on that cover there, this is going to be awesome. Yes, that's a very cool looking cover. <laughs> it is. Uh, staying with Marvel, we have the ultimate issue of Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099, number five. Yeah, Bob, how excited am I about this one? Because <laughs> look at that cover there for one thing. You've got Miguel O'Hara fighting a steampunk techno-organic man thing. And when I talked to Steve Orlando about this character last night, uh, he informed me, you know, he was like, how do you keep... How do you take a character like Man Thing, who doesn't have a lot of dialogue, who doesn't really say anything, you know, has like an eternal monologue sometimes, but, uh, you know, and basically his his power is like if you fear him, then you burn. He was like, how do you make that into a new updated character in the 2099 universe, but still retain uh, his core and everything? And he was like, I think I did it. And I was like, man, I can't wait. If you have, if you're new to the podcast and you haven't figured it out by now. <laughs> Dan really likes Man Thing. It's such a wonderful character, uh, and and again, like Steve was saying, I mean, it takes somebody with some talent to write that character. It really does. 
it, it's very easy to flub on that. I mean, uh, sad to say, I love R.L. Stein, but, you know, R.L. Stein did a Man-Thing run uh, a few years back, and it was terrible, you know, because he doesn't, he didn't understand the character, and he didn't understand what made him tick. Uh, and you have to understand that. Mm. And finally, sticking with Marvel, we have Dead X-Men number one. Bob, I am not going to lie. I'm so excited for this, but we do have our other Steve friend to thank for this. Steve Fox, friend of the show, friend of the podcast. Uh, we had a great interview with him a while back where he talked about anything and everything, yeah. uh, especially Dead X-Men. Uh, uh, Bob, this is really, really cool. This is a four-issue tie-in to the fall of the House of X and the rise of the powers of Ten. And the saga will revisit the key moments in reality's past that paved the way to Krakoa as a team of fallen mutants are sent through history by Professor X on a desperate mission to reverse Krakoa's fate. This is so... I can't say the F word, but I'm going to put like a cool beep there so it sounds like I did. Effing cool. Um, I'm excited about this, Bob. This is going to be freaking awesome. There you go. He did say the <laughs> F word, just... Yeah. A different one. Yeah, I toned it down a little bit. You know, we're covering an all-ages book on this podcast, Bob. I can't have a, you know, eight-year-old uh, kid tuning in to hear about Dungeons & Dragons and hear mean old Dan saying the F word. That's not going to work at all. So. so, yes, and those are just a few of the books coming out and hopefully coming out near local comic shop next week. Bob, and speaking of books that are coming out, hopefully coming out next week, and, and a few books that we didn't touch on, uh, uh, we've got three books on our lovely wheel here, uh, brought to you by wheelofnames.com uh, for all of your wheel needs. Check out wheelofnames.com. Wheel of Names, where the hell are you? I mean, where's our sponsorship? We're doing it for free at this point. We're sending you so much traffic, you can't even handle it. Uh, uh, three names on the wheel here. Uh, Kit Cuddy presents Moon Man, issue number one. That's right. Kit Cuddy, the rapper, has a comic book coming out. Uh, we've got Dynamite Comics, uh, written by Greg Pak, Lilo and Stitch, one of... Uh, one of my favorite Disney properties of all time, Lilo and Stitch. A lot of fun, so we're getting a comic book adaptation. And then from Ani Press, we have Jill and the Killers, number one. So three books here. Uh, I'm going to spin on the wheelofnames.com wheel and see which one it lands on. Bob, get excited because looks like we are covering... Bob, in a... Wow, I mean... I, I've got to turn. I've I've got to turn the computer here so you can see how close it was. It has landed on Lilo and Stitch, so we will be covering that. But look at how close we were to Kid Cudi's Moon Man. I mean, it was right there. It was neck and neck. Lilo and Stitch got the win, so uh, that's what we'll be covering next week. Make sure you guys tune in for that. But until then, please check us out on social media, Bob. They can use the hashtag all new different nation, oh, sorry, all new all different nation to be entered in our weekly comic book giveaway. Uh, you guys can check us out on Instagram at ANAD underscore number one comics podcast on X at ANAD and Comic Pod on TikTok at ANAD number one comics pod and on Utah. <laughs> wow. YouTube under the comic book channel. You just said Slow say. down a little bit, right? Uh, check us out on YouTube under the comic book channel. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. <laughs>